Hi, everyone, and welcome. Nice to see you all here this morning. Um, you know what? I'm just going to jump right in because I have a little bit of an introduction kind of within the... Um, oh, I'm host as well. Okay, sorry, I just realized. So let me share screen, we'll share this, and I'm sharing. So now you should be seeing something that says exploring inclusion through exclusion. Awesome, because I have different, mon different monitors, and sometimes it's not always evident what's being shared and where and what you see. So I am actually going to go straight into, I need to move this out of the way so I can see things. Sorry, straight into my presentation, easier from here. So exploring inclusion through exclusion, um, which sounds kind of funny, right? But let's, uh, I'm in different screens, so I, my, my mouse is working in different ways. Um, this presentation is on a website that I put together for this. Some of the one of the ways that I work as I'm preparing any type of presentation or workshop or working through concepts and ideas is I, I make a website. It's kind of like this optimal level of distraction that I need in order to be able to focus my thoughts. And so I focus it all into a website. And by organizing the material on there, it helps to organize my thoughts as I'm going through this process because this. Um, um, workshop that I'm presenting. It's the first time I'm doing this workshop. And so I'm still working out some of my ideas behind it. I will put this into the chat, which I should have copied earlier. Just one moment. Dun, 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 just so that it's easier for you to click on instead of here, copy. Of course, now I lost my chat screen. I lost my screen. I mean, oh, there we are. There you guys are. Okay. And I'll put it in here so that you don't need to copy it, but it is inclusion exclusion 22. The, sorry, the presentation is within that. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. Whoops. Let me go back. First, I'm going to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Tracy. Um, I see many familiar faces here. It's so great to see you all. I see some, some uh, less familiar faces as well. So wonderful to be able to see everyone here this morning. Where I am, I'm going to continue my, uh, my thing first. Um, I'm in, uh, I work with the First Nations Adult Education School Council. And um, it's an organization that works with adult education centers on different communities in different communities across Quebec. I live in Montreal, also known as Jojage, and um, I benefit greatly from working and living here. And this is land that I recognize as, um, you know, it's unceded territory taken care of by the Ganigahaga of Ganawage. Um, and today in Jojage, Montreal, I am seeing just at this moment, the sun has come out and it's a bright sunny day and it's beautiful. So that's how it is where I am. This is my game plan. Um, it's really going to be kind of a simple workshop. <laughs> if, you're, if you're looking for bells and whistles, it's not here. Um, basically, we're in the intro right now. That's pink. We're going to be doing some questioning and exploring around this idea of inclusion through exclusion and then wrapping up. This is my game plan. Um, it's probably going to look more like this because that's how conversations go. I don't have like a, doesn't have to go the way I planned it, but um, we'll see if we can get some questioning and uh, some, some exploration done. As well, I'll be presenting mainly in English. Um, I'll be presenting in English, but all of my material is available in both on this, um, on this slideshow, as you'll see in just a moment. As well, if you want to participate uh, by speaking or in the chat, either language is fine. Um, I may answer in a bit of Franglais, but either language is fine. Now, exclusion. It's like, ah, no one wants to say it. It's like this dirty word. We don't want to exclude anybody, right? But I'm going to take a look at um, a quotation. 
I keep hearing things, but I don't see, so I can no longer, I don't see where the admit is anymore. I have too many screens, it's hidden somewhere. Um, so we, we don't like to talk about exclusion, but I was reading this book last year and I've been reading it over and over again. I mentioned it in the description. It's called, get it up here, Mismatch, it's backwards for you. No, Mismatch by Kat Holmes. Um, and there's a lot, I have resources in that website link about her so you can find out more about her. And here's a really big, ugly looking quote on the slide, but it talks about exclusion as a universal human experience. I'll let you read it. So the idea of exclusion as a universal human experience, it's concrete and specific. And we can trace it back to, you know, we can trace back those feelings of exclusion to like, I felt excluded when this happened. You know, there's something very specific about it. And so it could become a meaningful starting point for, you, for inclusive design. And that's kind of the, the, um, the, the basis of this book that she wrote. So I'm gonna ask you right now to think of a time when you felt excluded. I'll just give you a few seconds to think about that. And then I'm gonna follow up on that question with what does exclusion mean to you? So if I'm thinking back to just, just one moment, I apologize. I'm not excluding. I will include you. No. Here we go. Sorry. I apologize. I have to manage a dog at the same time who's, who's doing things I didn't want him to do on my bed. Okay. So exclusion. What does exclusion mean to you? I'm going to invite you to, to type out some answers in the chat as well as if you want to at any point, just turn on your microphone and start talking. Because I'd like to kind of get our minds in this idea of our own um, experiences of exclusion and then what it could mean to us. How many people are we? Two, four, six, eight, ten. Actually, I don't need to count. I can just look, right? So there's 18 of us. You know what? We're a large group. I'm going to create some breakout rooms. Um, here, I'll put four breakout rooms. I'll let you choose a room. I've created them. I'm going to open them. You can choose a room, about four or five people per room, I guess is how it works, maybe four people per room. And we're gonna spend about five, 10 minutes thinking about this. Does everyone see the breakout rooms at the bottom of your screen? Anyone who doesn't, this can be a breakout room and you just stay here. Do we just uh, click on the breakout room, Tracy? Correct, just click on where it says uh, join or it might just be the number of the breakout room in the participant view, I'm not sure. Okay. And if there's too many people in one room, go to another room. Okay. I'm Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Hi, Carla. Hi, Abby. Sarah. Hello. Hi. Looks like you have beautiful sun, Michelin. Oh, man. It's about time, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> it's cloudy here in the north. <laughs> oh, man. We need those the snow to melt a little. We need Tomorrow. To see 12 degrees. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> How are you, ladies and Abby? <laughs> <laughs> Adapting, <about exclusion? laughs> Adapting quickly to this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's a steep learning curve. <laughs> Good though. 
very nice people to support you. So that's really grateful. Yeah. That's it. That's it. So, so I guess. Uh, yeah, no, I think she wanted us to talk about a time we felt excluded. There's two parts go, to the question. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I can go first. Well, when I first started teaching in uh, up into Miskaming, I was a pure Anglophone from out west. And uh, we were expected to, I was expected to understand the French meetings because I'm within a, a board. And I felt very excluded because of my language barrier and just uh, out of my water, out of my place completely, as I used to be more like sociable and talkable. So that was difficult. So for me, that's, that was the, that was my thing. Yeah. Hope it's okay. I've decided to join this group. Hi. Go ahead, Avi. No, it's funny that you mentioned that. That's actually going to be my story too, is that I'm usually, you know, I like talking a lot and socializing. Yeah. And sometimes when I'm, I'm in meetings that French is not my first language, especially kind of government type meetings, I'm very quiet. And sometimes there's a lot of stuff being said, which is, doesn't really apply. And I feel badly because I'm not really participating and I don't want to come off as the, you know, the outsider. And it just sometimes feels uncomfortable. Well, I could, I could add to this. Uh, in my case, in my case, it's not uh, necessarily a language thing, but it was more like a sex thing. Uh, being a woman in a, in a, because I, like I, my first degree was in engineering, mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. So we were a classroom of like 70 students and we we're two girls. So we were excluded by everyone <laughs> like the teachers my name up to the fourth uh, year was the girl i didn't have a name until fourth uh, fourth year and that was awful so i had to adapt to the environment versus the other way around you know i had to wear the big jack clothes the the looking boyish so i fit in and that was awful so that's why when i have a dog i i have a daughter now I'm so gun ho of like saying, you stand up, be you, you know, because I knew how it was. It was terrible, terrible. Yeah. So that reminds me, Michelin, of, I mean, Abby, this happened a few times. Abby and I, we used to work together and um, we were both technology consultants at a provincial level. And quite often we would be presenting together and what would, invariably happen is if anyone has any technical issues here's abby abby's here to help you <laughs> and tracy like we have to say it like it's oops i meant to mean session i'm just going to run back to the the main room to say to see toby it happened a today. lot it was uh... <sighs> And yeah, I was going to say for me, like it just, it starts really early. Like, you know, like my first memories of being excluded are like, you know, gym classes where the kids got to pick their own teams and you're standing there at the end feeling like, you know, you don't belong in a, in a team or things like that. I think um, a lot of my experiences are probably similar. There was definitely the language thing when I moved to Quebec. There's the woman in science thing, <laughs> not to the extreme like, like you, Michelin, but uh, I could see that being extra, extra hard in engineering and things. But I was also, what I had put in the chat before we joined the group was, I had said, it's like when you're just not part of an experience and it might not be intentional. Like sometimes people intentionally exclude someone. Like it's very obvious, we don't want you here. Um, but sometimes it's just, it's innocent. You're making me think also even just online, right? Like when we have these hybrid classrooms and uh, I remember like when the pandemic started, I asked to visit one and you know, the online group the teacher was trying to be inclusive, but it was so hard because you had this like sort of subgroup of online students with the offline and. Yeah. This reminds me in one of my classes also, I had, uh, had a group of students who came from the same culture. And no matter like sometimes you try to kind of bring them in, bring them in, it's like they want to be excluded too. That there's sometimes also 
not wanting, like it's not you wanting not to include. It's sometimes a group wants to be excluded sometimes too. It's interesting <laughs> because this comes up in the presentation. Yeah, because it's, well, it's this, is, this is the thing. This is the thing because you know sometimes when you're conscientious about being excluded, you go the extra mile, and sometimes you see that pushback also that we don't want to be, <laughs> let's say, part of this. We would just give us what we need and let us be right. And this is an interesting thing. And yeah. I learned, and I learned, there's many ways to be excluded in an excluded way. You're absolutely right, Tracy, because <laughs> yeah, it, it comes back to me for many years. <laughs> and, and right now, like the has everyone had a chance to say something? Who wants to say something about what does exclusion mean to you? Yes, and here's Toby. I want to introduce Toby to our little group. We're actually only going to be here for like Hello. another 30 seconds, Toby, or another minute, and I'm going to bring everyone back to the main room. But it was just a chance to get our head around this idea of exclusion. And so I was asking people to share, what does it mean to you? Like, can you think of a time where you felt excluded? And, and what does it mean to you? You just jumped in. So I'm not going to, if, if you don't have enough time to think, I'm not going to make you speak or anything, but it's up to you. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Because I'm the first time using this. I have somebody in my office with me. So I'm trying to use this to be more quiet. But um, I don't know. I, I, I find recently, like, I like being excluded from things because <laughs> I was too involved in everything before. And since COVID, it's like, I find I, I just, yeah, when I get to business, get it done. And that's it. Before I was so into all the, you know, human interactions. And I used to feed off that energy where now it's like, I just want to do my job and then get on with my life. Like it's, I, I don't know. COVID seemed like I had the opposite on me. It's interesting how COVID has kind of maybe changed our idea of what it is to be included and excluded because the, the environment all of a sudden is so very different, right? Because where do we want to be included or excluded? We want to be, but where, where are we included or excluded from? It's from an environment and our environment has changed so much. It's a really interesting perspective. Oh, it's too loud, yeah. I want to make sure that, uh, that everyone's had a chance to speak before I, we go back to the main room. So Abby, I'm no longer host. So if, um, if you could... Maybe shut down the rooms. Okay, so people are starting to come back in. I'm going to need to share my screen again. Can you stay there? You know, my dog does nothing all day long until I stand in front of like a Zoom meeting. Then he decides he has to go underneath the bed and get stuck. And, you know, like all these things. It's inevitable. Abby, you host. Can... As soon as the breakout rooms close, we'll let me make you host again. Okay. Three seconds. Very well. Here we go. People are starting to pop back in. You're still co host. You should be good. I should be good. Great. Yeah. Um, I think everyone's back at this moment, right? So I'm going to start to share my screen again. Okay, that's where I want to share. So we were just talking about, I, I, I joined one of the rooms, which is why they lasted maybe a little bit longer than I had planned, because it's always like that. And when you, once we get, at least for myself, once I get into a smaller group conversation, um, it's hard to stop. So the next question. Um, so now that like the, the reason why I broke off into groups was because, um, and interestingly, this was feedback that Abby and I got at one uh, at a workshop that we did many years ago, um, where we were doing things in stations, and one of the teachers said, and it, it just always sticks with me, that in a regular workshop, because this was a workshop, Abby, it was at LCEQ, I think, our first big stations workshop, so we had like 60 people or something. We had a lot of people. We had, yeah. we, we had a 60 to 80 uh, participants. 
And one of the women at our at, at the table said that if it had just been a workshop, she never would have said anything because there were just too many people and she didn't feel comfortable speaking. So when I asked the question and I saw that there were some people who had answered some things in the chat, but no one was speaking. I was like, no, that's it. We're going to go off into breakout rooms. And I don't know about in, in your room, but in our room, um, everyone, pretty, I don't know, a lot of people were speaking. Um, but I'm going to just look back at, at some of the things in the chat, like being ignored, being left out, whether it's on purpose or accidental, not feeling like I'm part of an experience. Again, it could be on purpose and it could be accidental. And, and, and for, I think for the most part, it's not an on purpose thing. It's just something that happens because of the way the an environment is set up or because or just like that because of our of, of, of our personal experiences, not being able to follow a conversation that happens in language a lot, feeling like I'm not wanted. And if we look at this next quote, this is again from Kat Holmes. I'm basing this on Mismatch by Kat Holmes for people who came in a bit later. Um, it's a great little book. It's very accessible in terms of like, you don't feel like you're sitting down and committing the next three weeks of your life to reading it. Um, and so this whole idea of if, we, if we're talking about inclusion, because as educators working at whatever level in our centers, whether we're teachers, whether we're support staff, whether we are uh, guidance counselors, whether we are administ you know, administration or working at the front desk, we're all interested. We want to. We want inclusion, right? That's what we're we're championing. We we want to make sure everyone feels included. And then, so if we think about who am I excluding, and we allow those answers to to um, change our solutions, maybe then we're starting to um, to approach inclusion. And I want to do a little note on accessibility. Because this whole idea of like we, we have a lot of there's a lot of catchphrases going that that go around right we talk about accessibility we talk about access inclusion an inclusive classroom an inclusive center um if things are accessible if things are inaccessible if we can access them like we we're using all the, like these variations on the same words and i just want to take a look and this is actually a link let's see if this works do you am i screen sharing now you see the website okay so Accessibility really has to do with this idea, and this, I'm still getting my head around it. So just jump in if you feel like, no, Tracy, you are wrong. I think it's different. Please just jump in and add. Um, this idea of access to material. So we're creating accessible material. Can my students use it, right? Can they access it? So things like possible obstacles to being able to access the material, is the text size too small? Or is there like a, um, is the contrast not contrasted enough for people with low vision? For myself right now, no matter what glasses I wear, I can't read anything. So I'm like constantly, I'm like this, right? Trying to read stuff on my phone or reading my book. I've got my glasses here, down here. I, I don't know, I, I can't see anything anymore. It's interesting when I cook, I have no idea what I'm making. Um, if there's too much stuff on the page, this visual clutter idea, sometimes we want to, you know, as teachers or even as, you know, just working in a center and we want to save paper, right? So we're trying to squish everything onto one page, but sometimes it doesn't, it's not helpful at all. People look at it and just put it aside. If we're using unclear language, like things like, that's why I'm trying to um, clarify a little bit on what I'm thinking about in terms of accessibility and inclusion. When we think of accessibility, so many people use the word that it's become unclear. Right, it's, it's, it's like, what do we mean by accessibility? So um, making sure that the language is super clear. Um, something that I used to do all the time, I relied on text within images. I would create a beautiful little poster or, or something like digitally, right? I did this with, um, am, I, am I sharing this whole thing? Like if I go to, can you see now a Google screen? Yeah, great. If I go to PD Mosaic, this is a, a website that I used to use. Now, that I used to use, that I used to like, I used it and I made it. If you see like all of the titles are in an image. You see that? Like it's you know, teaching and learning strategies, that's a picture. What I've done is I've gone back and I've put some alt text in there. So that's some alternative text so that somebody who is reading this with a screen reader will have 
access to the words, but it's not as great as if I had just had the words written there. That would have been a better solution. Um, let me go back to, where am I? Ah, it's over here, okay. Um, technology know-how, like assuming that, you know, oh, all of our students, they know how to use technology. Like that's also, maybe that's an obstacle for some students, especially when they don't wanna say, oh, I don't know how to use that. And even the access to technology and internet, I mean, I remember times where I've, you know, planned um, workshops or materials that was reliant on Wi-Fi, and then we were in an area where Wi-Fi was not um, uh, reliable or even accessible at all. When I worked at down in the Shattagee Valley at, you know, in Huntingdon or something, and then all of a sudden, oh no, we can't access that right now. So, thinking about these kinds of obstacles, they're very mechanical and technical. But then, if I look at Oh, it was over here, also accessibility. Now, this is where I'm getting my, I, I'm, I'm still in the thinking process. And that's the, the purpose of this workshop is to, to kind of talk about these things with other people. This idea of, okay, we've got all of those mechanical and ability-based, like, can I access this material? But then there's also cultural accessibility and the spaces that are accessible. Um, in, in our group, one of the things that came up, I don't know why it does this, but anyways, in our group, one of the things that came up had to be with, you know, I tried to include, I wanted to include people, but they, they wanted to be excluded. They didn't want to be included. And it got me thinking, and some of my thought processes as I was going through this had to do with this idea of how do I know that I am making my space welcome for everybody? I may think that I am including everyone, but there are certain things that I am doing unconsciously um, that kind of keeps up this exclusion. So some possible obstacles. And again, I'm just, I don't, I'm not like, I'm not an expert. I, I'm just, these are things that I'm thinking about and please jump in if you see anything else. Um, representation in materials. When we're building our presentations, who is in our stock photos? Are we showing just like the, the, the same type of person all the time? Am I including everyone in my class? Um, things like exam rooms, who are they impacting? You know, there's a lot of people who have had really bad experiences related to schools, and this could be generational related to learning and schools. And when we have an exam room where we're telling people, you need to leave your bag at the front. You're not allowed to speak to anybody. I'm going to take your phone from you. Like, how is, how is that impacting people? Uh, again, related to visuals, classroom decoration, who's in your posters? The language that we're speaking, who understands you? Work schedule. Sometimes like, it's like, well, they never come to school, but if we don't bother to ask, why is it? Some people, they may get fired if they don't go to that shift. So well, how is the work schedule impacting um, uh, how is it an, an obstacle for them? Or childcare, people might be missing because childcare. Um, important dates, and some of these are gonna come up um, later on and worry and anxiety. So how is that impacting and how are we intentionally designing our courses, our classrooms, our centers, our materials, so that we are eliminating some of these obstacles as much as we can. So for me, I think, this idea of like, there's the accessibility that's really about, can a student read it? Can a student listen to it? Can a student walk in my doorway or, or roll it through my doorway? And then there's this whole other aspect of inclusion and exclusion around culture and feelings of acceptance. And those are the ones that everyone, at least in our group spoke about when we talked about what does exclusion mean for you? It has to do with that feeling of acceptance. So let me get back here. Um, so I think to summarize it, and this is how I'm summarizing it in my head, accessibility, can I use the material? Inclusion, do I want to use it? And that's something that came up in our um, conversation group was this idea, but they don't even want to. It's like, well, maybe they don't want to use what you designed for them. How can we explore this a little bit further? And I'm not saying that was the case to the person who said it, but just that's something to think about is how are we designing our materials for inclusion? So an example, 
And this I'm going to be asking you. I'm not going to go into breakout rooms just because it'll, well, we could, but no, we'll just do this together. I'm going to encourage you to speak if you want to, just turn on your mic or use the, um, the chat as some people did earlier. So a school-wide team building activity in September. Who could we be excluding? I don't know, Avi, if you remember this. This is from my own personal experience this past year. I know the answer, but I'm not gonna jump in. <laughs> think about it, there, there's many, I mean, there are many possible answers. Matthew, I think I saw you open your mic. Yeah, could it be like, I'm thinking of students, um, sometimes some of the support staff that we might forget about, um, even in a school-wide team building experience, um, exercise? That's right. Sometimes like you'll have a school. I, I know that, you know, I, just recently up until January, I was actually working in an elementary school and we had support staff that worked through K through six. And so even though it was a school wide team building that was kind of they had different things for, you know, um, the, the older grades and the younger grades. And so, you know, some of the support staff that could have used that time to bond with the older kids, they were used to supervise the younger kids. So absolutely. Anything else about school-wide team building experiences, Sarah? Well, I know at our school, we have like continuous intake. So we have students coming in throughout the year. So if you just do team building in September, you're missing all those students who have come in throughout the year. Absolutely. What happens to the student who arrives in October and every, or in January or in November and everyone's already kind of had this bonding experience? That's a, a form of exclusion. Uh, also, I think sometimes we tend to exclude students who have different needs, like, for example, students who have, let's say, anxiety or, let's say, crowd uh, uh, anxiety issues by kind of saying this is the only choice you have. So by giving only one choice, sometimes we're excluding people who have different needs but want to be included sometimes. That's right. Absolutely. And I'll, absolutely. Um, and, and even also um, ability wise in terms of like physical ability, the student, you know, if, if we're planning kind of uh, usually a lot of these have to do with uh, there's like physical, you know, there might be a race, there might be tug of war or something like this. And if there are people who cannot physically do that and they're left to sit on the side, it's um, I'll tell you my example this year at my son's elementary school. There was a school time wide team building activity so exciting like dynamics or something came in it was on Rosh Hashanah. So like, even though there were probably about three or four Jewish families in the school. Those kids like they were like my son was really mad at me that he wasn't allowed to go to school that day. You know, so just something little like uh, I'm going to go on to the next slide because it's like a follow up. How can our answer change how we plan those activities? And so if I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking like Michelin's answer. Well, I won't have just one choice. I'm going to make sure that there are multiple choices so that everybody can feel included and that it's not just here's the choice for the kids who can't do that, but that everyone's mixed up, you know, so that we're feeling included um, to answer my question. Well, I'll. I'll, I'll take a look at the calendar before I do this and see, okay, is Ramadan happening then? Is, uh, are there Jewish holidays? Because these are holidays also that it's not like the, 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 um, the Christian holidays where they're like, it's always December 25th and, and, and what, you know, it's always the same day. It's always different. So every year it could be beginning of September, it could be middle of October, we're, we're never sure. So we need to just, um, check the calendars. I mean, that just, that, that was an easy fix, I think. Um, and there was other one, oh, continuous intake. Well, how do we kind of design team building as something that happens all the time? Why does it have to happen at one time of the year? So that as we have new people coming in, we can continue to welcome. I'm gonna go on to the next one. I have a little editorial commentary on this one using primarily text based materials. Who could we be excluding?
Tracy, by text, I assume you're, you're saying print material? Print or, or text. Like uh, it could be text, uh, it could be any type of text. Primarily text, could be like, like we could say print or we could say print plus uh, also text online. I think that's mainly based on, like the, I guess, reading. I this guess it's so messy in here. Sorry. Like, oh, you can't see. Okay. Go ahead. Someone was going to talk. No, I'm just saying the visual learners and the auditory learners who don't necessarily like to read. Sorry, I realized I have a SOFAD book there and I was going to pull it out. It's one of those CCBE books, like the old ones, that I don't know if they still use those, these huge, huge books. But yes, the, the, the student who um, doesn't necessarily get information well through text, we're missing out on a whole lot. And I'm thinking, of, for this one, I was thinking about courses like less the reading courses, like less English and you know, less the languages courses, but courses like math and science and history, when it's all based in, in text, when those are not the only competencies, you know, the, the, the dealing with text that we're trying to, um, uh, to develop in those courses. So how can our answer change how we plan in this case? If we know that, as Michelin said, there are a large number of learners um, or a large number of adults who don't necessarily receive information well through primarily text. And I'm also looking at, um, as we're welcoming students, as we're like looking for students to join our centers, how are we presenting information about our centers? It's not only in the classroom, but it's, it's um, school-wide. Just realize that there's a chat. And then image with the adding, adding image with the text. So we're mixing things up, adding image because that's another way of reading, right? Using immersive readers, videos that have subtitles, absolutely so that we can start to open things up, right? The whole idea here is how do we reduce the obstacles? How do we think about these obstacles before we even start? Hands-on activities. So in, like if I'm thinking of a math class or a history class where the primary, the, we're primarily learning through text, through our SOFAD books, how am I changing things? How can I add other ways of learning? I'm going on to the next one. Sarah. Um, well, I just think we also have to, though, look at our final exams, like, you know, especially like our math exams and things like that, because there is, they're all based on reading, like you said. So they are definitely excluding, you know, we can do what we can in the classroom, but then we are expecting them to go to an exam room and read those, those exams. So something to look at too. Yes. And I, I find our exams are very exclusionary. <laughs> they, I mean, in, incredibly. They, um, and I've, I've had conversations with people at Sanctions about this and, and, and was yelled at. And it, because there, there's, this idea, and this has to do with the kind of like this, I don't know if anyone has ever seen this video, um, this TED talk called, the, I think it's called The Myth of Average. It's based on a book, uh, it's Scott Rose. I think that, that that name is in my head. I'm not 100% sure. I'll take a look at that. But this idea that we have to design for the average person and, and this assumption that the most people learn through reading. And, and so, um, that they had to make choices in the exams and they had to make sure that the exam is the exact same no matter where you are in the province and no matter how you are accessing it, whether you're a distance learner or an in-person learner. And so in order to respond to that, they made them very text-based. But that, that's a whole other presentation and conversation, I think, around the exams. I remember one thing that, Avi, again, I remember this story that you told about um, fixing your toilet. Now this sounds like, okay, look, this really- No, it's good, really... go for it, go for it, it's great. Do you want to tell the story? 
Thank you, Matthew. He just put the link to the the, um, the TED to talk my about toilet. The Do you remember it? <laughs> yes. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same point that you're driving. I was going to see a bunch of stuff about the exams, but I'm going to hold my tongue because they're just, anyways, let's talk about the toilet. Okay. So um, basically when I moved into my house, I'm not handy at all. Like I can do stuff with technology, but ask me to fix a toilet or fix a door, forget it. And um I believe the when I had to fix the the whole mechanism in the back of the toilet, it came with this whole printed instruction sheet. And my wife and I looked at it and we couldn't figure it out. And there was 15,000 steps and we're going to call the plumber and we're like, no, we are going to do this. So what we did is we said, let's sort of change it around. We decided, hey, let's go to YouTube. Maybe we can watch a video of it. It will make much more sense. And lo and behold, we watched the video. And to this day, that toilet still works. Using the YouTube video, uh, we were able to figure out how to fix the, the, the toilet. So we didn't need to rely on the, the print instructions in order to fix it. So the final exam was fixing the toilet, but in order to learn how to access, how to do that final exam, you were able to, to, to learn the, the, um, the, the toilet fixing skills um, in different ways. I need a I different way. Yeah, and I think some of that, I mean, I, I think this whole idea of these final exams being incredibly text-based um, is something we need to work on. It, like, it's, like I said, it's a whole other, um, I think, workshop and a whole other conversation, but something to work on across the center, across subject matters, so that the, the language teachers are working together with the social sciences and, sci and technology and math teachers so that, um, reading skills can be worked on across the curriculum that's a whole other thing but i definitely agree with you jenny something that always gets me is we can put all these adaptations in place while we're learning but when we get to the exam everything's stripped away that always gets me so we can put readers in we can do but when the exam has come nope you, you got to do it on your own that always got me yeah, well, if a student legally has the right to readers and things like that, they can't take that away on the exam. But um, no, definitely. I mean, the exam is a big thorn in our side. It's a big thorn in everyone's sides. And it's it's a big, huge mess. I mean, I, one of my questions is has to do with exam room. You know, how, who are we excluding in the exam room? But um, I think if we allow the exam to take over our love of our students and our teaching, then we are doing us, I'm doing myself and I'm doing my students a big uh, disservice. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, yeah, I had an experience with my students where a social worker came in and was doing a self-help uh, project with them, very young, very nice, very energetic person. But what happened was he used the example of golf and uh, my adult ed students are, they're not into golf. They don't even can't afford to get on the green to do golfing. So um, it was kind of a real tough workshop to slog through and they were patient, but at the same time, so unconnected to the reality of our students. And that happens often with certain, uh, certain people that we try and bring in. Um, good, good intentions, but just uh, way off the mark. Yeah, and I think that um, like if we talk about our presentations, what is the content that we're using in our presentations? This has to do with visuals as well as the metaphors that we're trying to use. So this idea of golf, or I remember all of my memories have to do with Abby, but, but this is because I just watched this a video um, that we created with um, a, another colleague of ours, Keish from um, from the English Montreal School Board. And Keish was talking about, and, I, and I'm I'm saying it because it's a public video, so it's it's not. Uh, so he's obviously given permission to share this story that he pre he prepared this amazing workshop that he felt was an awesome workshop, and at the end of it, one of the um, or a group of the teachers said, "We don't have Macs at our school or iPads. We can't do use any of these apps that you showed us." And so, even though the content was you know, according to him, it was fabulous. And if you had a Mac, if you used an iPad, it was fabulous. But if you don't have access to that, it's not, right? And so that's the same idea as the golf metaphor. If I don't have access to that imagery, like for me, golf also would not like 
this would not connect with me. And so what are the visuals that we're using? So we could be excluding, you know, a, a, a number of people, depending on what types of things we include in our, in our presentations. And so how can our answer change how we plan? And I think Michelle said, um, this didn't connect with any of our students. So prior to making the next presentation, how can my answer change how I plan that presentation? I always leave little pauses in there just to let give time to, for thinking because I can talk and talk and talk and there's no time to think. So I can talk with my students beforehand, with, with, with the adults beforehand, get to know the students. Or if a presenter is coming in from outside and they're coming into a center, let them know here are some of the interests because we collected these, we, we collect these throughout the year. These are some of the interests. Here are our student profiles. The majority of our students are from the age of 16 to 22 or whatever it, it has to do for your center, right? So that we provide this information. Um, this makes me think of, I mean, currently right now in Quebec, you know, everyone has heard of this new, um, uh, it's, it's not gonna affect um, adult ed right away, but it will eventually, this new um, uh, Quebec citizenship, I don't, I don't remember what it's called, citizenship and culture course that's gonna be, um, replacing ethics and religious culture and when and it's supposed to be starting this September and when it was announced the announcement was made that this was created in collaboration with indigenous communities across the province when in reality it hadn't been and so now what they're doing is they're going back and they're doing some consultation activities but think of all of that time that was wasted at the beginning and not only the time that was wasted, but the insult. And we talked about feeling left out, right? Those feelings of not belonging. So when I prepare an activity for my students and as I'm doing the activity with them, I realize, oh, that person can't access it because, oh yeah, they don't have, they, they, they need to see a video or they need a transcript for the video or they need this or they need that. And then I have to go back and re kind of adapt. There's a, that period of time where the student realizes I wasn't planned for. And that makes me feel like crap. It happened to me this past year. Um, so con consulting and being, and being aware. Um, so here's the big one, exam room. Someone was gonna say something. I was go just ahead. gonna jump in, Tracy. I'm thinking of a lot of the work that we did together. I know for us, it was important to consult with the people we we're going to work with before and during the actual sessions you know letting the participants drive the professional development and not coming in with a whole plan of what we want to do with them and also when possible to try to talk to them beforehand so that you know we know our audience so we're not just coming in and okay here's our amazing thing we're going to show you that doesn't fit with your reality it kind of reminds me of the the quiche example that you gave anyways just wanted to to bring that in professional development huge with this too not only students Yes, not only students, absolutely. I've included this example because of an anecdote that I have that I'll share in a moment. But exam rooms, who could we be excluding? But I see chat, I'm being very bad with my chat. I need to pop it out on the side. How do I do that? Someone tell me, I don't remember. Isn't there a way to make sure, let me just put it here. Okay, so getting to know their students and using images they connect to. Nickelodeon characters, superheroes, depending on the community of your school. Some of the answers will not work in other schools or centers. It depends on who your school or center is. Jenny, who the students are. For are. our exams, I remember going in, we called it the little gym and all the things were lined up and they a few times had to pull me out. They're like, are you okay? You look like you're blue or you're going to pass out or and I was at high level. And I didn't know at the time I had any sort of I knew we always know I had ADHD, but anxiety related to it. And yeah, and they could, and I was just freaking out, you know, I'm going into science and I was applying into all these things and they could see how stressed, and they had to pull me out. I wasn't even able to do my exam. The anxiety around exam rooms are, is, can, can 
like we could have learners who are fine in math. And then as soon as they have to suffer through this exam room, I included this because I have a very, this, it's something that happened. I don't want to say where I worked or anything like that. I just want, I'm trying, but I, I'm trying to figure out the timeline. It happened over 10 years ago, for sure. Um, but with like around 10 years ago. Yes, probably around exactly 10 years ago. I was working with a student who, um, I, I was a resource teacher at the time, and I was working with a student around math in, in, in adult ed. And we knew that there was a big exam coming up. Exam days were Thursdays. They were exam, they were the math teachers who shared the exam days. And so what they did was they divided it up so that um, students taking the exam would be in the exam room and everyone else in math would go into the other room with the, with the other teachers. And then at one point, so I'm working with other students. And at one point I see this, this man come into the room and he just says, can I go sit down? I said, yeah, sure, go ahead. You know, like our room was open door, anyone could come in. So I continue working with other students and then like 20 minutes passes by and I see, oh, he's still there. And then I remembered, wait a second. So I went over to him and said, what are you doing here? You have your exam this morning, what's going on? And, he's, and he looked at me and I remember him, he said, I have never believed in intergenerational trauma before this morning. I always thought it was bullshit, like for lack of a better word, pardon my French, but that's what he said. I always thought it was an excuse. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if anyone saw going in the background, my, my 11 year old home, I homeschool too. Um, I always thought it was an excuse that people used when things weren't going well in their lives and they blamed it on intergenerational trauma. He says, I was in that room sitting and there were teachers at the front telling me what I was not allowed to do. And I couldn't think. This man was 42 years old, not a little kid, right? And, and I'm just thinking those teachers had all the power. The way that those exam rooms are set up, they are putting huge obstacles in front of anyone who's got any kind of, of trauma to do with authority, trauma to do just with, with excess rules and regulations to do with school. And if we think about it, a lot of our students in adult education are there because the school system, you know, didn't quite work out well for them in the past, or they're looking to, they're looking to, 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 for a different solution. And I'm kind of, I'm just aware of the time that we have five minutes left. So I'm just gonna kind of go through this one a little bit quickly. How can our answer change how we plan? As teachers, we don't wanna impact our students in this way. No one does. As not just as teachers, as center staff, we don't want our students ever to feel horrible like this. So are we gonna allow that exam to make us, make our students feel this way? And these are just thoughts. I'm not, I, I, I don't have any concrete answers, just thoughts. Um, I think we talked a little bit just about materials and digital materials. We talked a little bit earlier about the idea of, okay, if I create these beautiful, you know, we use Canva and we use uh, different tools to create like uh, infographics, you know, or posters with, with words in them and stuff. And just to be sure that we're not excluding anyone who can't read those things. And so again, looking at, you know, how does our answer change how we plan? It's always looking at those ideas of who are my students? Who are the learners and how am I making sure that I have multiple ways that people can interact with my material? And also not just in terms of being able to physically read or listen to, but what are the examples? Who are the authors? Who are the, um, the websites? Who are the, like, who are in the videos? Am I including people that my students look at and say, oh yeah, that could be me. Am I including representation? That's super important. Um, I included this one just really quickly. I think it's the last one. 2022, I'm thinking of coming up. We've got Easter coming up and I know that I've worked in centers where we had big Easter dinners. 
It just so happens this year, the month of April is Ramadan. So anyone in our centers who does not eat during the day is automatically excluded from this, right? Um, it's also uh, Passover this year happens to fall on the same day as Easter Friday. So for the next eight days, there is no kind of public eating going on um, for, for our Jewish students. So how can our answer change how we plan? I don't have answers for this. It's how, it, how would it change how you plan these kinds of things if your purpose is you do not want to exclude? And we always think, I know for myself, whenever we have pizza lunches or big like Thanksgiving meals or something like that, the idea is to include everyone. But if we're unintentionally, if we're, if we're not, like, not on purpose, excluding some people, I know I wanna know about it. So these are just things to think about. So this idea of understanding exclusion and who we are excluding before we release things into the world, before I plan my lessons, before I plan my, my um, uh, uh, team building activities or my celebrations, how can I understand who I'm excluding and then kind of plan that away? And this is just something to think about because I, I don't, I don't wanna go over time, but something, something to think about, the time in your practice, when it could have been a good idea to think about who might I be excluding before I do something big. Because very often it's something that's tied to my own values as a teacher or as a consultant, or I'm planning something that I think is gonna be awesome and, I, and I'm doing this for other people. And then I realize, oh crap, I unintentionally excluded some people in the way that I did this. So I, I can think of a few times in my practice and it's just, I'm not gonna ask you to share this. It's just something to think about. Reminds me of universal design. If people here work with universal design for learning, this whole idea of let's imagine the possible obstacles to learning and design them away. So let's imagine all the possible obstacles to feeling welcome and comfortable in our centers and in our classrooms, and let's design them away. I'm not gonna do it by myself, I'm gonna do it with my team. Um, and this was, I, I saw this video yesterday, Corey Joseph, he's a blind user experience designer with Microsoft. And he says, if we don't plan for inclusion right from the beginning, we are just gonna be excluding people, there's no question. Because if we don't take the time to think about it, we don't know, and we will exclude. And I think that's it. And I'm saying thank you in a whole bunch of languages to the people who live in Quebec. These are some of the ways that they would say thank you. So Nyawa, Walalan, I always stumble on this one. Chinas kumitem miigwech, merci, and thank you. And I hope that like, I wasn't here to um, provide all kinds of like, here's the, the solution to your problem, but just, to start thinking about how we are excluding. And even when we don't realize that we're excluding, sometimes we know we're excluding certain people, but most of the time we don't. And thinking about how that relates to our own feelings of exclusion. And that's it. Um, that, that's one last thing, the, the link that I gave you at the beginning, is it still in my, yes it is. Here we go. That's the link to the website that I put together for this. It will always be there. And so everything on that site, um, feel free to explore and, and reuse if you want. And let me stop sharing so that, because I can see you as a big group, but I've just realized you can't. There we I'm go. I'm going to jump in super quick. First of all, yeah, time to stop. huge, genuine thank you. You've like completely made me rethink the way I'm going to start working. It's amazing looking at the content beyond just looking at the, you know, all the accessibility tools. So that's amazing. Other thing, just as an announcement for everybody, we are going to be on break from 1045 to 11. And after that, you're going to return to the gather. So I'm going to put that in the chat, the Zoom chat. And that's what I want to say. So thank you, Tracy, so much. Like, a one incredible. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone who, who, who was here and who, uh, who spent the morning with me. Loved it, Tracy. Very, very helpful. Simple, but yet very in-depth and usable immediately. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle.
Thank you, everyone. Gracie, I'll try to reduce my pedagogical myopism. Lots to consider. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Nice to see you, Frank. <laughs>